night, and everybody. I'm back. It's me, resident super villain, Mr. J. Washington, and I am here with my review for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. If you have not seen the movie yet, bring your ass back. It's going to be spoilers. Y'all already know how it goes. Uh, I've got a bunch of new subscribers who jumped on board since my Rise of the Beast trailer reaction, so I thank y'all. I appreciate y'all, uh, everybody that rocks with me all the way across the board uh, from the Mad Titan podcast, whether it be on TV, screen, internet. Thank you, sincerely. Um, let's just get right into it. So, if I have to order MCU films, it goes Infinity War, number one for me. Yes, Infinity War, not Endgame. So many people, so many people like Endgame more, and I think it's because you get the whole collection of everybody and you finally get the Avengers Assemble. But for me, I'm, I like the fact it was Thanos' story. Y'all are in the hand. It's Infinity War, number one. Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3, number 2. Followed by Winter Soldier, and we go through this list. I love this movie, man. Yo, I think this movie best is described, I put it on Facebook, is James Gunn unhinged. It is James Gunn giving free reign to do what he wanted to do because he was closing off his story, right? He told you this was the last iteration of this guardians we were going to see so there's no reason to connect to the larger mcu which is so dope um and because of that i think we got a story that is that told that, that completed the story of, of of the guardians that left potential for shit going forward but i yo i just love what it did overall I laugh. When you laugh, I laugh my ass off. When you cry, I cry. Listen, the scenes of watching Little Rocket, just to see the opening sequence, to watch the high evolutionary grab the pup Rocket Raccoon, and then when Rocket starts getting worked on, and then him, first time him talking, and just says, hurt, it breaks you. Because then you see Lila, who she's got these mechanical arms, and you see the other two, and you see that they've just been experimenting on them the whole time. And you feel for them. And I know, you know, I don't ever want to be that dude that says, but like, it's going to get you. It's going to be, it's something I would really, if you take it, if you've seen it yourself and you're waiting to take kids, I would really do some discernment for that because of that shit getting so emotional. Even to the point where, and again, spoiler alert, when Lila is murdered and the friends are murdered, that shit hits you. Um, to see all the different elements of it, the one, the, you know, the different elements of you never knowing if anybody is going to die and when because James Gunn take you, takes you on a fucking ride. Their point, you have the one with the three big monsters. I can't remember what they were called, but we saw them in Guardians 2 at the beginning. And you have Drax and uh, Mantis stuck with them. you like, yo, this is how they die. You get the point where you think Gamora's out of here. You get the point where you're like, yo, Nebula's going to die. You get the point where you're like, yo, Star-Lord is gone. And even Rocket. And so all these moments. But I will say, again, spoiler alert, for to have it where nobody died. Nobody died. Because we automatically expected Dave Bautista saying, I, I'm done. I don't have to be Drax anymore. So we're like, oh, for sure, they're going to kill him off. You know, and then you're thinking like, well, Rocket's got to go. This is Rocket's story. But for him to let everybody go their separate ways at the end of the film and, and Star-Lord go back home and, you know, Rocket being a part, uh, being the new captain of the Guardians, Groot being grown and Groot actually talking and saying, I love you guys. What the fuck? Speaking of fuck. I was like many people who thought that Marvel was saving its first F-bomb for Deadpool. I thought, you know, this is the movie. We knew what it was in Fox. So we knew, you know, when they brought it over, it was like, yo, this is going to have to be, are they going to change it? But then you find out it's going to be rated R. But to have the first F-bomb be dropped by Star-Lord in this movie, I was cool with it. I'm surprised I didn't, myself and a lot of others, others didn't think about it. And also, here's the beautiful thing about it. It wasn't forced. It wasn't forced. I, and I say that because if you remember Venom, let's go save the fucking world. Things like that. It's certain things that's forced. This one is just him t at one point when he's in the car on Counter-Earth trying to get to where the lab and everything. 
uh, him him doing the whole deal with the holding the latch and the lock and everything with Nebula, who doesn't understand a car door, and then tell just open the fucking door, and it's like, it's a real way you would say it. So I I was cool with that. You know, it's like I was shocked for me. I was like, damn, they have any guardians? Um, Karen Gilliam as Nebula, by the way, she takes it up such a notch because she finally just has enough with Drax's quote unquote stupidity and snaps on him so hard and then turns around and snaps on Mantis who snaps back on her. The 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 fever pitch, the boiling over and everything, that was great to see throughout it. But again, you know, they they're family. So they have these arguments, but they're still together as family family. I put this on Twitter, I put this on Facebook, I said this to people I've talked to in general in person. The high evolutionary goes up on my top tier villains in the MCU. I don't say he's the best for me, but God damn, his level of evil and his justification for why he does what he does. There are moments when he's, you know, after he first starts experimenting with Rocket, he's playing with little Rocket. You know, he's, he's, he's comforting him. He's growing. He's molding him, talking to him, and to find out that Rocket's a genius you know, and when he finds out Rocket's a genius because of some of the ways he was trying to make the creatures, they all turned out with rage and anger. And just to see how went, how he went back to treating them after making it look like he loved them. But then to watch how he just didn't give a fuck. He just was killing everything. Like the level of villainry that the high evolutionary is. It, it sucks that he had to be a one-off villain. Now granted, I don't know for sure because he does not die in this. So, again, spoilers. Rocket has the opportunity to kill him, and he won't kill him because he's a member of the Guardians. He will, you know, he's always wanted to kill him, but he won't. And um, the part when you get where Rocket, where the High Evolutionary has him kill Lila and the friends, and Rocket maims this motherfucker's face, you're like, God damn. Ah, uh, that was great. Another big part of this movie is the return of the Sovereign, Aisha, the High Sovereign Priestess, and the introduction of Adam Warlock. What I love in the story, how James Gunn told us, you found out that the High Evolutionary created the Sovereign. And we know that the Sovereign, Aisha, made Adam Warlock. Will Poulter's Adam Warlock is perfect because he has a little bit of childishness, a little bit of goofiness, and the reason being because Aisha even says, my lord, you took him out of his cocoon too early. He wasn't fully, fully done. So Adam being, you know, as he's supposed to be this perfect, the warlock, but he's super strong, super powerful, but he still has these tendencies of a child because of, you know, him being early. And he cares for his mom who died. She gets the fuck blown up out of her when uh, the high evolutionary destroys counter earth. I, you know, I think everything played itself well. I know a lot of people wanted to see, inevitably Gamora and Star Lord get back together. But again, I think I have to commend James Gunn on not going that easy route, letting them go their separate ways. Letting because this Gamora now is a Ravager. We've seen it in the trailers and all this, so it's pretty much she's a Ravager and Star Lord is, you know, he's trying to get back to where he was with Gamora and she's just not going for it. And I love the fact that there was never, you know, she has this little sweet on him for a second moment, but it never becomes this big thing where she's going to be back with him. And so that worked out well. The uh, post credit scenes aren't really major, but it is showing you, you get the new team of Guardians, Kraglin, Cosmo, uh, Groot, the LePig thing. I forgot who else is in it. Um, And then you get Peter goes back home. Because the big thing was Peter was given his uh, picture of his grandmother, his grandfather, excuse me, and his mom. And, you know, they always mentioned you never went back home. You never decided to go back home. And he finally goes back home, even older. Um, Drax has this moment where there are these kids that are about to be experimented on with the high evolutionary. And the kids don't speak what we would consider English. There's another dialect. And Drax finds a way to communicate with them, which leads Nebula to understanding Drax is a different type of person than she what she looked at and viewed him as and labeled him as. She was she tells him, You're not meant to be a destroyer. You're meant to be a dad. And so that is another thing. I just think I think I was talking with one of my buddies who uh one of my good friends, shouts out to Lamont McGee, Lamont McGee, 
who is one of the who is the consultant producer on Star Wars Young Jedi Adventures. I highly recommend y'all check that out. Support my bro. It's a dope ass animation project he did. Please support that. When we were talking, I think one of the one things we did, what we would have liked to see is the high evolutionary's origin. And I, I'm pretty sure in some longer cut gun might have, it might have that. But I think we need to know, did he come from Earth itself? Because at one point when Rocket is, you know, Rocket and the Guardians are freeing all the creatures that the high evolutionary is still testing with, testing on and with the kids, one of the crates says North America. So he knows about Earth. Clearly raccoons are from, the raccoon is from Earth, as in Rocket. But did was he an earthling that somehow got brought into space or how does that work for him? Like, you know, we know he's a dude named Herbert in the comics, but it's like, is that story played out now? It's not a major, major thing to want. I know a lot of people want origins for any main character every time. And I sometimes feel like depending on the character, you can have a level of mystique and mysteriousness as to what who, who and what they are. And if as long as it doesn't hurt the story, you know, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't matter. And I think with this one from this, again, this is my, all this is my opinion with not knowing the full origin of the high evolutionary. I don't think it takes away from the movie at all um, to watch what he does, how his people, how his minions up under him bow to and, and, and go to his every whim. And they are scared of him because you see he, he's so smart his suit is powered up and he can do everything. He's just, he's badass. If I did compare it minus the council, it seemed like the high evolutionary was a bit better than Kang. Now, granted, we know Kang is this ultimate scientist from the 31st, 30th or 31st century, but the level of what we've seen with the power in the high evolutionary compared to the level of power we've seen in Kang, it's like, yo, now granted, we may be getting more likely getting recast, a recast from Jonathan Majors, whoever's going to take because Kang has variants, so it's easy to pull that off. But I don't know if because of the Kang, the way they said, unless they just go straight to a Mortis, if we could get a, a, a villain as strong as that. Because what the High Evolutionary did, yeah, granted, he lost everything as his ship, you know, as his people around at one point, his people got tired of it and was basically committing mutiny on him. Um, it was just a level of villainy. It was just the way he was and the way he was portrayed was so dope. Uh, I wish I could pronounce his name and I do not want to butcher it, but getting introduced to him as Myrn in Peacemaker. And when I found out he was a high evolutionary, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here for this. And the look, you know, there's a look when somebody gives you this menacing look and you get that. And, but again, when you watch it play out, um, some people are going to just try to be mad at this movie to be mad. Now, will I say some of them are legit criticisms? No. Honestly, I won't. Because here's one that I brought up, and I know people are going to say it, because I've been seeing the gun haters talk about it on Twitter. What is that? His wife's in the movie, Jennifer Holland. Now, I said this on Mad Titan. I will say this on when we go back to the break room for new rock stars everywhere. If I'm a director, my wife is an actor, and we can keep the bag at home. That's what I'm going to do. This is nothing new. What's his name? Paul D Paul W.S. Anderson. Uh, I think that's his name. Uh, let me see. What was the, He was the director of... Some of y'all probably yelling it at the screen. But I'm going to find out real quick. Because he was the director of the first Resident Evil film. His name is uh, Paul W.S. Anderson. Yeah, that was his name. Mila Jovovich is his wife. Every movie he directs, he puts his wife in. When Tim Burton was with Helen Bonham Carter, every movie he was in, he, Seth Rogen has a group of people he always uses. Adam Sandler, uh, Quentin Tarantino. Directors always have people they, they're familiar with, they will use consistently. Um, so let's not act like this is a playing favorite thing. This is something that's been going on in, in the TV and film industry for eons, as long as it's been around. Um, it's just that I, I've know I've known known and noticed and seen since Gunn had become the head of DC Studios along with Peter Safran, people are now nitpicking when his wife is in things. And it's like, yo, that's what you do. Some people are like Jay, I wouldn't do that. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. 
especially look, especially when you get in the bag to go home. The bag come back to the crib. It's nothing wrong with that. Um, like I said, I think this movie is is it's not too long. It is not. It doesn't. It gets to it. It gets to it. Like I said, when you see there's parts when you laugh at the shit that the Guardians do or what they're going through, you laugh. There's a part, Nathan Fillion is in it. Oh my fucking God. You know, there's a scene that we all have seen in the trailer with the different color jumpsuits. And what we see what that leads to is this one place of the Orco, I believe it's called, or the Orgo. Please forgive me. Um, You see what it leads, and you deal with Nathan Fillion and then him with his like, his underlings, because he's like a head of security. And it's so much shit he does that makes you laugh. And then you're going back and forth. And there's a part where fucking Nebula, I'm not Nebula, excuse me, Mantis and Drax are trying to sneak in. And Drax has to, the security guard is flirting with Drax. And he's like, no, not again. Which means they do this regularly. And you see Mantis cracking up because she knows what it is. It's fun shit like that you get that we've seen in other films. We've seen in TV shows. We've seen people in real life do. Um, like I said, because you have to, this movie balances humor and hardship well. It balances it very well. Um, some people are going to say, watching this right now, you only say that because you're a Marvel fan. I am a Marvel fan. I'm also a DC fan. I'm also a DC believer. Uh, because I believe now things can be on a better, you know, I know it's going to be the most obscure characters and stuff like that. But uh, that's how I felt when it came to the first Guardians. Like I told everybody, when Guardians 1 came out, if you can love a talking raccoon and a talking tree, they can do anything they want with that film. And he's done it. Do I think 2 was perfect? No, I think 2 was exposition central. But I think 3 was the perfect ending, the perfect landing for this Guardians of the Galaxy saga. Because the Guardians is an interchangeable team. And we see that even at the end of this. So, again, there is no connections in the post credit scenes to the larger MCU. There's no need to. This is its own self-contained story because it closes off the Guardians. Now, it does tell you that Star-Lord will return. Now, does that mean Star-Lord gets his own Disney Plus series? Does that mean we don't see him again until Secret Wars? Or does he pop up in different other films and projects? We don't know. But I don't think we'll see this. I mean, we probably will, or we might not get this whole collection of Guardians together again for Secret Wars. Not There's no for sure. But... It's only meant to be, you know, it, it, we just got to wait to see. All right. Uh, at the end of the day, this is just my opinion. It is not law. I am not one of them pundits, critics, whatever you want to label it, that will sit there and say, yo, this is how it's got to be. I've talked to people who have been like, when I told them how I felt, they felt the same way. Do we all consider it dogmatic law? Absolutely not. But nonetheless, if you've seen this, which you should have, if you sat through all of this so far for almost 20 minutes, I need to know what you think about it in the comments below. So go ahead and like the video. Subscribe to the channel. Click on the notification bell so you find out when I'm dropping more videos. You'll get, you'll get my reviews, my trailer reactions. You'll get my shorts. I throw a lot of shorts up, whether they're uh, reactions or stand-up bits. You'll get those up too. So please make sure you go ahead and support that. Um, Follow me on Instagram, TikTok at Mr. J Washington, M R J A Y. You should know how to spell Washington. Check out the Mad Titan podcast everywhere you get your podcast from. I get you caught up on all the things happening in the Marvel and DC live action cinematic universes. Is Barbershop Talk for Nerds? Come on in the convo and check out the BBC Club podcast. That's the Black Boy Content Club podcast with myself, Chris Burns, and Moses Prim. Man, we talk pop culture, news, sports, summer, everything. We have some funny conversations and a whole lot more. You can listen to us anywhere. Download us anywhere in podcast form if you want to watch the visual. We are over on the Moses Prim YouTube channel. Check that out. All right. I will holler at y'all later. Till then. Take care.